1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is a unique chapter in the Bible in that it is wholly dedicated to the, the topic and the doctrine of the resurrection. It begins with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then it talks about the benefits of the resurrection, and then it talks about, uh, God speaks of the fact that one day, because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, one day we will also rise from the dead. Uh, one, of the, one of the blessings uh, that I got this week was uh, when we had the, when we had the uh, uh, committal of Carlton Breyer's body to the ground, uh, I looked at that casket and said, you know what, that body's not going to stay there. One day, God's going to raise that body from the dead. And I know that, and I'm absolutely assured of that because of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. And uh, that, 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 that resurrection not only gives us, and we'll talk about it here in just a few moments, but not only gives us salvation, but it gives us hope for the future. And it gives us something to look forward to. To. I want you to look with me, however, and we're going we're gonna to do some backtracking, but I want us to start the very last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's all stand together, if you would. And I'm going to ask that we, that we read the verse together out loud in unison from your King James Bible so that we're all on the same page together. And so if your neighbor doesn't have a Bible, uh, allow them to look on with you, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Let's read it together. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's bow the word. Father, thank you so much for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ because of his resurrection. We have hope. We have salvation. We have power to live in the Christian, in the Christian life on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Lord, uh, uh, we have forgiveness of sins because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're so thankful that he died on the cross, and we're thankful that he died for our sins. But if that was the end, we would be of all men most miserable because then that would mean he's still in the grave, but he's not because he rose again and gave us victory over death, hell, sin, and the grave. And we're thankful for, for his resurrection. We ask God as we, as we consider that this morning and the implications thereof, uh, Father, we pray that you would bless, that you would speak to our hearts and we pray, Lord, that you would meet needs of people. We, we, we live in a day and age where I'm sure every person here has, has, has some needs, and, and particularly some spiritual needs. Father, I pray that, that those needs would be addressed, would be met, that you would be a, a blessing through your word and by your spirit. And as you speak to our hearts, may we say yes to you this morning, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. You may be seated. We're going to do something kind of unusual. I'm going to, start, I'm going to start a message this morning with a conclusion, because really that's what verse 58 is. It's the conclusion of the whole chapter. And the conclusion is, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is is not in vain in the Lord. Now that's a, that's a great verse and it's an encouraging verse and it's a challenging verse, but it doesn't stand alone. Therefore uh, means that it's directly related to everything that was said beforehand. And verses, verses one through verse 57 are, are some of the greatest verses in scripture on the doctrine of the resurrection. Uh, doctrine uh, isn't an end in itself. Uh, if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then it ought to mean something. And when I say mean something, it ought to have an impact on your life. Uh, the resurrection is just not something that we think about once a year. 
and uh, we, we, we celebrate it by coming to church, we remember it and so forth. If it doesn't impact your life, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. And the truth of the matter is, is that uh, uh, doctrine and what we believe is not an end in itself. Uh, doctrine ought to affect behavior. And uh, there's, there's problems, you know, when, when uh, all we do is amass to ourselves facts and figures and, and, and so forth from the Bible, but they don't impact our life at all. Right doctrine always demands right behavior. And, and you see this throughout Scripture. Uh, one of the, 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 the passages, that, or one of the books that I see it so clearly in, it's the book of Romans. Romans talks a lot about the salvation that we have in, in Jesus Christ. And uh, if you want to, want to have a better understanding of what salvation is all about and how that it's, it's uh, simply an act of faith where we come to God and, and, and trust him, trust in his death, his burial, and his resurrection and that alone. Uh, the book of Romans is a good book for that. But the book of Romans is written in such a way the first 11 chapters are just chock full of doctrine. Then you come to chapter, chapter uh, 12, and the Apostle Paul says, uh, through inspiration, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. In other words, he says, because of all that I've told you, God says, of all that I've told you in the first 11, 11 chapters, that ought to change the way you live. Doctrine ought to affect behavior. What you, what you believe should really make a difference as to how you live. And what we're going to do is this morning, we're going to look at three things that are affected by the resurrection. Uh, we, you know, we say we believe in a resurrection, okay, but how does that affect us on a day-by-day -day basis? First of all, uh, go, go all the way back to, uh, in chapter 15, to verse 1. And look with me in verses 1 through 7, the beginning of the chapter. He talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Um, that's talking about the fact that Jesus died on the cross. He was buried in three, three days and three nights later. He rose again from, from the dead. Christianity is unique because Christ's resurrection is what gives us faith and Christ's resurrection is what gives us hope. Look with me, if you would, uh, down in verses 12 through 22, same chapter. Beginning in verse 12, it says, Now, if Christ, and here he's talking about why the resurrection is so important and what it impacts. It says, Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. In other words, let's just dismiss, let's go home and have supper. Because if there is no resurrection, then the preaching of the cross and the preaching of the resurrection is vain. It's foolishness, it's empty. Verse 15, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. And we're a bunch of liars because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be uh, that the dead rise not for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. 
ye are yet in your sins. In other words, you don't have forgiveness of sins if there is no resurrection. The resurrection is what gives us victory over death, victory over hell, victory over the grave, and victory over our sins. And then in verse, uh, verse 18, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. In other words, if there is no resurrection, then there is no hope in the afterlife. Verse 20, however, corrects all that, says, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and because the, uh, become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Uh, our Savior is a great Savior. But he's a great savior because of the resurrection. Uh, our resurrection gives us hope, and it gives us hope of victory over sin. The Bible says if there was no resurrection, we would still be in our sins. And that really is what the issue is. This is, this is the issue of salvation. Uh, the resurrection affects our salvation because if Christ is not risen from the dead, then we're still in our sins and we can't possibly go to heaven. But the Bible says that Christ died on the cross. He died for our sins. He didn't die for most of our sins. He didn't die for some of our sins. He died for all of our sins. And he paid the price for our sins because he knew we couldn't do it. By the way, nobody can do anything about your sins but Jesus Christ. Just him. Only him. You can't get rid of one single sin in your life. And that's the reason why you need the Lord. And that's why you need a risen Savior. Because that risen Savior has, has gotten victory over your sin and over my sin. And uh, uh, death and, and sin were, were, uh, were defeated uh, not only at the cross, but at the, at the, and completed at the resurrection. And we, we have a hope of seeing loved ones like Carlton Breyer someday because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you keep your finger here in 1 Corinthians and go backwards a little bit to the book of Romans. Go to Romans chapter 10 with me, if you would. Romans chapter 10. In Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, tell us the importance of the resurrection. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Salvation hinges on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the way a person obtains that salvation, now just because he did that, just because he, he died on the cross and he died for our sins, does not mean that everyone's saved. We all have to, to come to a point where we realize that we're a sinner that we realize that because of our sin, we deserve to die and go to hell for all eternity. Why is that? Because sin is against a holy God. Sin is against a, an eternal God. And sins against an eternal God deserves an, an eternal punishment. And, and that's what we deserve. We deserve to go to hell for all eternity because of our sin. But the Bible says that Jesus loved us. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of the verses that I learned as a, as a young, young person, long before I ever trusted Christ as Savior, I learned the verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Obviously, some of you have learned that too, because you just mouthed it when I was saying that. Um, that, that, that tells you that God loved us so much he was willing to send the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, 
came down, took on human flesh, died on the cross as the perfect payment for our sin. Why? Because we couldn't pay for them. And you can't. There's no good you can do to get rid of sin. You can't get baptized for sin. We're having a baptism this morning, but please understand that baptism does not wash away one sin. They're not, getting, they're not getting baptized in order to get saved. They're getting baptized because they've been saved. Because God has already forgiven all of their sins from them. And they have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. He has given them eternal life. And the, the Bible makes it very, very clear that we need to come to God and say, Listen, uh, I have nothing to offer you, but you have everything to offer me. I, one of the, one of the, some of the terminology that's being used today about salvation, uh, it, one of the terms is give your life to Christ. I got news. When you get saved, you don't give anything to Christ. You don't give him your, he doesn't want your life. He wants your trust. He wants your belief. He wants you to trust in him. He wants you to come to him for mercy. You're not offering anything to God. God's offering something to you. And that thing that he's offering to you is eternal life. And then the Bible says, in fact, just down from those verses that we just read in the book of Romans, it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But what does a person have to do? They have to believe those things in their heart. They have to believe that they're a sinner. They, need, they have to believe that they're heading for hell and that the only way that they can get their sins forgiven is by trusting Christ and what he did on the cross. Not only what he did on the cross, but that he rose again from the dead and that he got victory over that sin through that resurrection. And that if you just simply call upon God and ask him to save you, you don't have to do that over and over and over again. It's a one-time thing. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Uh, how, how often does a person get born physically? One time. How often does a person get born spiritually? One time. It's when they come to that point where they realize that they must trust Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, for the forgiveness of their sins. So the resurrection affects salvation. But not only, not only does it affect salvation, but it also affects separation from sin after a person gets saved. Uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to look in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and down in verses 33 and 34. Verse 33 says, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now, this is right in the middle of a resurrection chapter where all he's talking about over and over and over again is resurrection. And what, what, he, what he states here is that uh, because of the resurrection, uh, we should be separate, we should be encouraged after, after salvation to be separate from sin. If you believe in the resurrection, you believe that someday, uh, even though you're saved, you're going to still stand before God and be accountable. Uh, over in Romans chapter, chapter 14, and, and in verse, verse 2, there's a, a verse that is, is kind of a, Kind of a, a sobering verse. And in, in uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, I said two, I mean 12. Uh, Romans chapter 14 and verse 12 says, So then, every one of us, speaking of saved people that have trusted Christ as Savior, shall give account of himself to God. There's going to come a day when each and every one of us are going to give account of ourselves to God. And we're going to give account of ourselves to the one who died for us. We're going to give account of ourselves and our life after salvation uh, to, to the one who rose again for us. If you, if you turn with me to, uh, 
to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You're in 1 Corinthians. Keep your finger there. But go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, next book. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look in verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. He's speaking to, to a church. He's speaking to a group of believers who have trusted Christ as Savior. And he tells them this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Because of the resurrection, someday we will stand before God and we will give account of our lives after salvation. Now here's the exciting part about, about the whole thing. Because of the resurrection, we have power over sin. Uh, you've heard me say already several times that, that God gave us uh, victory and he got victory himself and passes that victory on to us. When he rose from the get dead, he got victory over death. He got victory over the grave. And so we'll have that as well. Uh, he, he had a victory over hell. We were talking last night uh, in men's prayer meeting. And uh, some of the men made the comment, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just so thankful. I will never see the flames of hell uh, and never be a part of it myself, uh, never feel hell's fire because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because I've trusted him and him alone as Savior. The truth of the matter is this preacher deserves hell for all eternity, but I'll never get it because I've been given victory over hell. But not only that, but I've also been given victory over sin. And not just over sin in the respect of forgiveness of sin for all eternity, but I've been given victory over the power of sin in my personal life. If you take your Bibles and just turn backwards a little bit, again to the book of Romans, and go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and, and if, if I can, just back up just a little bit uh, to uh, verse 18 of chapter 5. It says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, speaking of Adam, uh, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift. And that's exactly what it is. It doesn't come by baptism. It doesn't come by keeping the Ten Commandments. It doesn't come by being a good person. It doesn't come by coming to church, although I'm glad you're here. Uh, it has nothing to do with those things. It's a free gift. Came upon all men unto justification of life, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That's Adam. So by the obedience of one, that's Jesus Christ, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. In other words, no matter how much sin there is in your life, God's always got the grace to cover it. Verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. However, verse, verse 1 of chapter 6 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin, because of forgiveness of sins, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And then he goes on in, in verse 5 down through 11. He says this, he says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, God's saying, you now have power that you didn't have before you trusted 
Christ as Savior. And it's the power of the resurrection, and it's the power over sin. We don't have to continue in sin. Should we continue in sin, the grace may abound. Well, the grace will cover the sin. But should we continue in sin? No, because of the resurrection. The resurrection should change the way that you live because you're thankful for what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you. The last song we sang was uh, just simply a, a song of thanks. And I thought, that was, I thought that was unusual. Grant, I appreciate you choosing that song because the resurrection ought to really give us a grateful heart. We ought to just really be thankful for what Jesus Christ did for us and the power that he gives to us. So it, it, it affects, uh, the, the resurrection affects our salvation. It affects uh, our, 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 uh, our separation from sin. God gives us that power to be separate and, and to not have to, not have to continue in sin. And then last of all, it affects our service. If you go back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look in verses 30 through 32. And Paul said this, and again, remember, it's all within the context of the resurrection. He says, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Now, what he means by that is he stuck his neck out and, and his life was in jeopardy literally on a daily basis. Verse 32, if after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. In other words, he says, because of the resurrection, he said, if there is no resurrection, let's eat, just, just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But Paul was saying that he put his life on the line on a daily basis. Why did he do that? Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, he says he's worth serving, he's worth living for, and he gives us the power to do so. Uh, if you go with me to, if you would, to 2 Corinthians, the next book, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And look with me in verses uh, 8 through 14. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8 says this. It says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the, in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always uh, delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We, having the same spirit of faith, uh, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. So he's saying, listen, he says, I'm not afraid to lay my life on the line. I'm not afraid to give my life a living sacrifice. And he, he put his life in jeopardy, was willing to do that because of what Jesus Christ did for him and because of the resurrection of the dead. Um, there, are, there are some, some people in history that... Uh, I just greatly admire, and and uh, one of them is a is a man who was a, who had a ministry uh, to the Indians. He lived from 1718 to 1747 here in America, and his name was was David Brainerd. And David Brainerd uh, did did not live a very long life. He lived from 17. 18 to uh, 1747, and uh, he died at the age of 
29 years old, and he died ministering to the Indians. He died of tuberculosis. Uh, he knew that. He was, he was supposed to be engaged to be married. Uh, that never came to pass. And uh, uh, he was willing to lay his life on the line uh, for the American Indians because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, he, he, he did not even blink at, at putting his own life in jeopardy so that he could get the gospel to others. Uh, there, there's a, a, another, another figure, another individual that uh, has greatly impressed me. And you know the name. The name is William Borden. Now, you might not know the first name, but you know the second name. Uh, it's it's uh, the one that's attached to the Borden dairy industry. And uh, David Borden, or excuse me, William Borden, uh, was born in 1887. And he was born to parents that were millionaires at the time. Uh, he, was, he lived in Chicago, and R.A. Torrey, who many, some of you know, know of, uh, R.A. Torrey was his pastor. He went to the Moody Church in Chicago. And as a child, he trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. And uh, he, he graduated from high school. He was a brilliant guy. He graduated from high school at the age of 16. At 18, he went to Yale. And then at 22, he went to Princeton. And he went to Princeton Seminary. And, and uh, uh, his dad passed away. And when his dad died, he became heir to the Borden Millions. And he, he surrendered himself as a missionary to China. And, uh, and he gave up uh, all, of that, all of that wealth and all of that fame because he really believed that God had called him to China. And so he surrendered to China to give the gospel to the Muslims. In, in the process, he uh, stopped in Egypt in the process of getting over there. He never actually made it to the field. And he did some evangelistic work in Cairo. And while he was in Egypt, he developed, he developed cerebral meningitis. And he, he died at the age of 25. Never even ended up uh, in the, in the, at the field that God had called him to. After he passed away, they found something in the back of his Bible. And in the back of his Bible, he had three phrases that were written, and they were written at, at, at different times in his life. The first phrase that he had was the phrase, no reserves, no reserves. When, th this is when he surrendered to be a missionary. In other words, he had no reservation about surrendering and being a missionary for Christ. The second one that he, he wrote was no retreats, and he, he wrote that after he graduated from school and was offered several very, very high-paying jobs. And he, he said, no. He says, God's called me to be a missionary. I'm going to fulfill that calling. I'm going to go be a missionary. And so he said no to all of those offers. So he wrote down in his Bible, no retreats. Then just before he died, and he knew he was never going to make it to the mission field, he wrote two more words. No regrets. No regrets. You say, he died at 25. Uh, he was, uh, he, you know, he, he, he basically, uh, you know, from a, from a world standpoint, he wasted his life. No, what happened was, as a result of his death and as a result of his testimony and as a result of his dedication, God called a whole bunch of other people to go to China. And, and some men and some women volunteered and became missionaries to China. More ended up going to China because of his death than would have because of his life. And, and uh, you know, unfortunately in America today, we have a give up, I quit mentality. Uh, when the going gets tough, uh, many times we just throw up our hands and quit. But that should not be our attitude. We ought to be willing to lay down our life for Jesus Christ. 
And if God doesn't ask us to lay down our life as far as giving our life, dying uh, for him, how about living for him? How about just taking your life and giving it, as the book of Romans says in, in chapter 12, as a living sacrifice? Why should we do that? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And again, we go back to the beginning of our message. Go to verse 58 where we started. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It says, be steadfast. That means be constant. It means uh, not wavering. It means we should always be going in a forward direction. It says, be unmovable, not, not shaken when pressured, uh, not wavering in our personal lives. And then last of all, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why is our labor not in vain in the Lord? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads bowed and eyes closed. No one looking around. In just a moment, we're going to have prayer, and then we're going to have an invitation. But before we do that, I simply want to ask you some questions. Number one, are you absolutely positive where you sit that if you died today that you go to heaven to be with the Lord Jesus Christ? Has there been a time in your life that you can look back to one time when you realized you were a sinner on your way to hell and the only way that you could go to heaven was by putting all your faith and all your trust in Jesus Christ and him alone as your Savior. If you know that for sure, if you know your sins are forgiven because of the resurrection of Christ, I wonder if you just raise your hand in the air as a testimony. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. All right, thank you. You can put your hands down. How many of you would be just as honest and say, I don't know that for sure, and I'd like to know? Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Anyone else say, I, I don't know that for sure. Would you pray for me? I, I count it a privilege to be able to pray for you. I'll pray for these two people that just raised their hand. Anyone else? Say, Pastor, here's my hand. I, I don't have that assurance. It bothers me. I'd like to know. Pray for me. All right, you're here this morning, and you're saved. Uh, you know for sure that if you died, you go to heaven. Are you steadfast? Are you immovable? Are you always abounding in the work of the Lord? Are you, are, are you separate from sin? Are you seeing victory on a day-by-day -day basis because of the resurrection? And are you serving God? With heads bowed and eyes closed, if God's touched your heart as, as, as a saved individual, because of the resurrection, and God's touched your heart this morning, and you'd like me to pray for you, just raise your hand. Say, God's spoken to my heart about something, preacher. Here's my hand. Pray for me. All right, thank you. I see those hands. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I'm so thankful that because of the resurrection, you still work in hearts. Because of the resurrection, we can have forgiveness of sins. Because of the resurrection, we have a reason, really, a good reason to live and to serve you and to stay separate from sin. Father, we pray for, for those two that raise their hand and any others that possibly didn't raise their hand, but they know that they have a need. I pray that today they would come to realize that they, they need to act upon that, that need and trust you and you alone as Savior. In just a moment, we're going to give an invitation. And my prayer is that those two and any others would come forward and just take my hand and just say, Pastor, I... I'd like, to, I'd like to know. I'd like to be saved. I'd like to get my sins forgiven. And we'll have someone take the word of God, take them into another room here in the building, and just sit down and show them how they can know that they can have eternal life and forgiveness of sins. And that's all possible because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I also pray for those that raised their hand and said that you were dealing with them about some things it's personal, it's private, it's just between them and you, and you know what it is. 
I pray, God, that you would, you would help them with that, those decisions, help them, Lord, to make, a, dis, make a, a definite decision to love you, to serve you, and give them the strength to fulfill that commitment. Father, we just pray that you would work in this invitation. Please have your will and your way this morning. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. This is what we call an invitation. And uh, if, if uh, you need to make a decision for the Lord, it's something just between you and God. The altar's open and uh, you're welcome to come. Now's the time. You're here this morning. You don't know for sure that if you died, you'd go to heaven. You'd like to get that thing settled. Just come forward. Just grab my hand and say, Pastor, I'd like to get saved. And we'll, we'll have someone take the word of God and show you how you can get that thing settled and how you can get it settled for all eternity. It has nothing to do with our church. It has everything to do with the Bible and the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and offers us the free gift of eternal life. As God's dealing with hearts, now's the time you come.